Welcome to Tennessee's at home learning series for literacy. Today's lesson is for all our third graders out there, though everyone is welcome to tune in. This lesson is the third in this week's series. My name is Miss Copeland and I'm a third grade teacher at Venus Stewart Elementary in Gallatin, Tennessee. I'm so excited to be your teacher for this lesson. Welcome to my virtual classroom. Every day I've been sharing a note to one of my students in my class who I am missing. Today's note is for Maria. Maria, I sure do miss seeing you and your sweet smile every day in class. You are so thoughtful and kind to others and you put your best effort into everything that you do. I hope that you are doing well. Love, Miss Copeland. If you didn't see our previous lessons, you can find them on tn.gov backslash education. You can still tune in to today's lesson if you haven't seen any of our others, but it might be more fun if you go back and watch our other lessons, since today we'll be take, talking about things that we've learned previously. Today, we will be learning how to use illustrations to understand the text better and make us how, they, how the illustrations make us feel a certain way. An illustration is a drawing or diagram used to add understanding of a text. Before we get started, to fully participate in our lesson today, you will need two sheets of paper, a pencil and a surface to write on, the student packet for ELA grade three, lesson 13, which can be found on the tn.gov backslash education website. Okay, let's begin. In our second lesson on the tale of Peter Rabbit, we read closely for words and phrases that the author gives to help us understand a character's traits. We looked for what a character says, does, and feels. While reading, we learned mischief and mischievous are related words that give us clues that someone is misbehaving or causing trouble. The author, Beatrix Potter, also gave us a synonym or similar word, naughty, to describe Peter's misbehavior. And remember when Peter was lost and very afraid of Mr. McGregor? Peter was so frightened that he sobbed, which means cried very hard. Well, I would be afraid too. Mr. McGregor tried to bop Peter on the head with a sieve. Imagine a big man chasing you with a strainer tool. Also, as independent practice, you are asked to write a summary of the tale of Peter Rabbit using your notes and vocabulary words. First, thank you for writing your summary using your notes and vocabulary words. Your summary may have said something like, the book tells us about Peter Rabbit, who is far more mischievous than his brothers and sisters named Flopsy Mopsy and Cottontail. Their mother leaves the bunny children alone, but tells them to avoid Mr. McGregor's garden. Mrs. Rabbit's husband had gone into the garden and ended up in a pie. However, after she leaves, the naughty Peter immediately squeezes under the garden gate to eat Mr. McGregor's vegetables. His brothers and sisters don't go to the garden with Peter. Mr. McGregor soon spots Peter in the garden. The gardener chases the sobbing young rabbit all over the garden and almost hit him with a sieve. Peter loses both his shoes and his new blue jacket. Finally, Peter saw the gate and returns home very tired. Mrs. Rabbit puts Peter to bed with only tea for dinner, but his good siblings got a supper treat of bread and milk and blackberries. Good readers put their thoughts together and can summarize a paragraph, a page, or even a chapter. Today, our goal is to become better readers by learning how the author uses illustrations to show what is happening and create mood in the text. We will be doing this by looking at and thinking about each picture. What do we know about illustrations? In the past, how have you used illustrations and pictures to help you understand what the author is telling you? Have you used them to understand mood the author is setting? The mood is how you feel while you are reading. 
such as happy, angry, or sad. Authors can set the mood by using words and phrases that get you to feel a certain way. For example, a grandmother baking a homemade apple pie might make you feel happy and remember good things about your grandmother. When an author puts in a dark, stormy night with a haunted mansion, you might feel nervous or even a little scared. Illustrations can help put the reader in the desired mood also. We will focus on the illustrations in The Tale of Peter Rabbit. Now, I will repeat my question. When have you used illustrations to help you understand the text? When have you used them to understand the mood the author is setting? Label one of your papers with the words note catcher. I'll pause here to give you time to stop, think, and jot your answers on one of your sheets of paper. You are so correct. Illustrations are more than just pictures on a page. You said illustrations help readers visualize or put pictures in their head to better understand. It sounds like some of you have used illustrations to help you understand a text. Take a look at the wet puddles in this picture. Those puddles and drips give us clues. Good detecting, class. We will begin with me working with you to understand illustrations. Then there will be time for you to practice on your own with my support. Finally, I will assign you independent work that you can complete after the video ends. Let's begin. Let's begin today's lesson by going back to our text and carefully looking at the illustrations. Remember, illustrations help readers visualize or put pictures in their head to better understand. We want to understand what is happening and how we feel about the text. Now look at the illustration on this page very carefully. I'll model this first illustration. We want to begin to think about what is happening and how it makes us feel. As I look at this illustration, I ask myself, what is happening and how does it make me feel? I notice that Peter is crawling under the gate and has not followed his mother's directions to stay away from Mr. McGregor's garden. This makes me feel worried and scared that he might get into some mischief. I'm going to use this sentence frame to help put my thoughts together. This illustration shows blank. This makes me feel blank. Now I will model the writing. This illustration shows Peter squeezing under the fence to get into Mr. McGregor's garden. This makes me feel angry because he did not listen to his mom. On my note catcher, I will write that Peter sneaks under the fence to get into Mr. McGregor's garden. I'll give you time to add this note to your note catcher. Let's look at another picture. First, we carefully look at the illustrations. Next, I ask myself, what is happening and how does it make me feel? I am going to pause and give you time to look at the illustration and decide what you think is happening and how it makes you feel. Now that you have thought about this illustration, I noticed Peter was being chased by Mr. McGregor or that Peter was running from Mr. McGregor because he got caught in his garden. Now I think about how it makes me feel. I feel a little worried or scared for Peter. Here is how I would write this note. This illustration shows an angry Mr. McGregor chasing Peter with a rake. This makes me feel scared because Mr. McGregor might catch Peter and give, make him into a pie. Time to add a note on this illustration on your note catcher. Great job studying the illustration. I heard you write something like, Mr. McGregor became angry and chased Peter with a rake. I'm going to stop here and check my understanding. I'll ask myself why the author wants me to feel scared that Peter might get caught and put in a pie like his father. Hmm. I think the author made this main character 
a cute, very cute bunny. I also noticed the bunnies are wearing clothes and acting like humans. This is called personification. Because the bunny seems like a baby human and I don't want babies hurt, I feel sympathy and worry for Peter. In fact, I find myself rooting for him. Funny how this bunny full of mischief causes me to wish him a great escape from Mr. McGregor. Beatrix Potter, the author, knew just how to use words and the illustrations to set the mood. Sometimes an author needs two or more illustrations on a page to support us as the reader. Let's look at this illustration. I'll read the text from this page so we can add information from our illustration. The text said, Peter gave himself up for lost and shed big tears, but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows who flew to him in great excitement and implored him to exert himself. Mr. McGregor came up with a sieve, which he intended to pop upon the top of Peter, but Peter wiggled out just in time, leaving his jacket behind him. As a reminder, to sob means to cry very hard and even making sounds. The sieve is a tool pictured over Peter's head in the picture. This tool has holes to let smaller items like pebbles fall through. Its job is to sort items. When I listen closely to the text and I look at the picture of Peter caught in the net and the sparrows, a type of bird in front of him, there is a detail I might have added if I was the illustrator. I'll read the text again for this illustration. Peter gave himself up for lost and shed big tears, but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows. What details would you add to this illustration to give the reader more information? I'll give you time to think carefully about what detail or details might improve this illustration. Oh goodness, you're smart. You're going to be great illustrators. Yes, I would have added big tears to help the reader know the meaning of sob and to show how frightened Peter was. Time to add to our note catcher. Write what this picture told us. Ah, uh, you noticed Peter almost gave up when his coat was hooked on a net. Peter got encouragement from a sparrow. Let's look carefully at another illustration and work on this one together. We start with looking carefully at details in the illustration. I want you to ask yourself, what is happening and how does it make me feel? I'm going to pause so that you can think and write your thoughts on the note catcher. Answer the question in this format. The illustration shows blank. It makes me feel blank. This illustration shows Peter crying as he is trying to find a way out of Mr. McGregor's garden. This makes me feel sad because I do not like to see Peter upset, scared, and crying. Time to jot a note of what this illustration is telling us. I'll give you time to write. Yes, I heard you say you wrote that Peter cries because he can't get out of Mr. McGregor's garden. This sets a mood that is sad, but it makes me wish hard for Peter to escape. You are doing a great job using the illustrations to understand what is happening in the text and how it makes you feel. Good readers use words and illustrations to set the mood for the reader. Along with choosing words and phrases carefully, Illustrations can help you understand the text. Please get out a sheet of paper and a pencil for this activity. Using your notes from our work in this lesson, you will retell the story on your sheet of paper. You may add as many details as you would like. I will pause while you work on this activity. Your retelling may sound something like this. The book is about Peter Rabbit who is full of mischief. First, Peter sneaks under the gate and gets into Mr. McGregor's garden. That old gardener saw Peter and chased him with a rake. Peter sobs and wants to give up, 
when his jacket button gets caught on the net. A bird hops down and encourages him to keep trying. Peter gets loose but continues to cry as he searches for the gate to escape. We have come to the part of the lesson that you will complete on your own after the end of this lesson. Here is your assignment. Draw an illustration from your favorite part of our story. Remember, the goal is to set a mood and help the reader understand the text. Be sure to add details to give the reader as much information as possible. In this lesson, you have learned how an author uses illustrations to help to tell the story by looking and thinking about each picture. I enjoyed reading The Tale of Peter Rabbit and looking at illustrations with you today. Thank you for inviting me into your home. I look forward to seeing you in our next lesson in Tennessee's At Home Learning Series. Goodbye. for Tennessee and today I'm standing in front of our education garden here at Glen Levin Farm and we're getting ready for spring here and about to put some plants into the ground so I wanted to show you today how you can grow your own plants at home with some food that you might have in your kitchen right now so we're gonna start with a tomato so this is just a grape tomato that I had at home but you can use any tomato that um, you have on hand, what you're going to do is ask a parent for help to cut your tomato in half. You can also do this with cucumbers or peppers. All right, tomatoes are kind of juicy, so you want to be sure that it gets the seeds dry out before you plant them. So you'll take a paper towel and kind of smear those seeds onto that paper towel and spread those around. All right, so you'll let those dry for about a day until they dry out completely. Now, I did some yesterday so that I could show you guys what they look like when they're all dried out. So these seeds are stuck on there, but they are dry. So what I'm gonna do is take one seed off of here, and then you wanna get some kind of cup and fill it up with dirt or soil. And you're gonna take your little tomato seed and push it down in that dirt, cover it up just a little bit, and give it a nice water. You're gonna wanna put all of these plants into a really sunny spot in order to grow. So find a windowsill or maybe even a spot outside on a nice day where it will have a lot of sunshine. All right, next is gonna be an avocado. I love avocados. They're probably one of my favorite foods. So I eat a lot of them and happen to have an extra avocado pit laying around. So what you're gonna do in order to grow a little avocado tree, might not produce any avocados for you, but it will still be a cool plant. Um, what you wanna do is fill up a jar or a cup with some water. You wanna fill it pretty high. Woo. And then you're gonna grab some toothpicks. Now the idea is that you're gonna be setting your avocado just down into that water. So you wanna take the bottom of the pit, it's gonna have a little circle on it, and you're gonna stick your toothpicks facing upwards a little bit so that this circle will be down into the cup. So you may need to ask for help with this part as well because toothpicks can be pointy, but you're gonna stick them in there and then you're gonna gently set your avocado right into that water. You want it to cover the bottom just a little bit so that the bottom is in the water and then it, the tree will start growing out of the top of that. Next up is garlic. You can get a bulb of garlic for like 50 cents at the store. So it's a great one to do and it's super easy to grow. What you'll do is take one clove and then take the bottom part and get a cup of dirt or soil and just stick that clove into that cup. Cover it up a little bit. Give it a good water. 
and again just put it in a sunny spot and that will start to sprout um, within a few days maybe up to a week you'll see that start to grow all right last one i'm going to show you is an apple apples like my favorite fruit ever so i'm really excited to show you this one again with the apple this is going to take a lot of patience and you might not actually get any more apples out of it but you can still start to grow a tree which is awesome i'm going to cut it sideways so that we can see the star inside is find some seeds in that apple so you're going to take your apple seeds and get a paper to another paper towel or napkin get it nice and wet put your seeds into that paper towel wrap it up put it into a baggie and then you're actually gonna put this baggie into the fridge again this is gonna take some patience you'll see that start to sprout maybe in a couple weeks maybe up to a month you can keep checking on your apple seeds to see when they start to grow a little white sprout that's when you know they're done and can go into some soil. So we'll put that one in the fridge to let it sit for a while. So now that we've planted all these things, let's take a look at what's gonna happen to all these plants as they grow. Next, we're gonna get a sprout. So this is actually a tomato sprout that I planted a few weeks ago, and it's just starting to come up out of the soil and it grows its first two leaves. Now after it grows those first two leaves of the sprout, it's going to keep growing. It needs water and sun, but it will keep growing into a plant like these sunflowers. It'll have more leaves, and eventually those plants will actually grow flowers on them. These sunflowers are really close, but not quite there yet. Um, but I do have some clover to show you some flowers. If you look so, really closely at a clover, you'll see these pretty purple flowers on top. So if a parent says it's okay, you can actually pull one of those flowers off and take a look inside of it and look up close. It's really fun to do. Um, at this point, there's a really important animal that's going to help um, these flowers create a fruit. Those animals are called pollinators. Our favorite here at Glen Levin are bees. We have them here at the farm. And those bees will go from flower to flower and carry the pollen. After that, these flowers will start to develop a fruit that's kind of similar to an apple or an avocado. So that fruit then contains the seeds that we plant. So that starts the whole life cycle over again and that makes your plant life cycle. Thanks for tuning in today guys. Join us next time and we're going to be talking about one of our favorite trees here at Glen Levin and I'll give you a hint, its leaves are shaped like a fan. Jeffrey, let's play a game while we're waiting for our food. Okay, this is a game about our facial expressions that show how our emotions about how we're feeling. And so I'm going to tell you a sentence, and if you can match your face with that sent what the sentence is saying, okay? okay? So for instance, how about, my birthday is tomorrow. Is that a good, fa excited face? Yeah, it shows that you're so super excited, right? Okay, so now I'm going to put this uh, menu up so I can't see your face, and I'm going to say another sentence, and can you match it? I am so sad that my grandpa is leaving tomorrow. Tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. What kind of face is that? Sad. Sad face. Like this? Yeah. When your lips go down, right? This is, it shows that we're really sad. Yeah, this emotion is sad. Okay, so you ready to do one for me? Yeah. Okay, you make up a sentence and then tell me to match, match the feeling to my face. I wish I couldn't go, I could go to the beach, but my mom says I can't. What kind of emotion is my face saying? I'm sad. Sad. Yes. Thank you for playing this game with me. I really liked how you used your sentences so that I could um, make my face show how I'm feeling.
Hello, my most amazing artist. Today, we're going to be creating something called an abstract work of art. An abstract work of art is a work of art that when you look at it, the focus is not necessarily on what the artist was trying to create realistically. Oh, no, no, no. It's something that is abstract, meaning that it involves mostly lines, shapes, and color. Those are just a few of the elements of art. The elements of art are the magical ingredients that all artists, including you, use to create their works of art. Why don't we go ahead and learn what those are before we talk about creating. The elements of art are line, shape, color baby, color, form, value, texture, and space. When an artist is creating an abstract work of art, they might make a work of art that simply is, like my dress almost, lines, shapes, and color. That kind of abstract artwork is called non-objective. We don't see or recognize any of the objects in it. A work of art that's called objective is an abstract piece where you might be able to see a couple of things that look familiar to you, but for the most part, it doesn't look realistic. We are going to be trying our hand at our very own masterpiece, an abstract masterpiece using lines and shapes. We'll be taking some of our favorite words, some happy, positive things that are rolling around in our heads right now to create our abstract masterpiece. We'll also be adding some color. I'm going to share with you how to turn your markers into paint. So let's get started. To begin, decide on whether or not you want your paper to go vertically or horizontally. That's up to you. And then take a marker and outline the paper. I'm just creating a border or a frame. I'm also using a permanent marker, and that's really important. You'll want to do this step with a permanent marker. Next step, break up the paper with two wavy, curvy, straight, zigzag, any kind of line that you wish to use. And I made my lines a little bit thicker by coloring them in. Now let's think of some positive words. Words that make you feel good inside. I'm going with a word like happy. As I write the letters of my word, notice that the top of my letter touches the top of my line. The bottom of my letter stretches all the way down to the bottom of the line. You can even go back and make the letters a little bit thicker by coloring them in so they stand out or contrast a little bit more. But it's important that you stretch that letter from the top of the line all the way to the bottom. Now, here's a really cool trick to paint with markers. I'm using what's called a washable marker. Most markers are washable, and I'm outlining the inside shapes of my letter. Now, to turn your markers into a paint, just add water. The permanent marker is going to stay put. It's permanent. However, the water-based marker that you used will turn into a paint and make for a beautiful abstract masterpiece. <laughs> 